Okay, we're going to get started for our last hour of the day, and we're going to finish up uh, this, this lecture on Rayleigh scattering. So again, let's look at, uh, let's try to explain a little bit how this, this works. If we go back, uh, we could see that the electric field is induced, uh, induced by the dipole is proportional to the dipole moment. Okay, so that's the propagating field. This means that this propagating field, which will ultimately call tide emission, remember we have this instant electric field, which is a laser, and this propagating this electric field is our emission, or we'll, we'll eventually call our scattered light. This is oscillating at multiple frequencies. Okay? So how does this work? Okay, so what we want to look at is a diagram and try to think about how this works. So again, step one, the incident field, Again, this is our laser, it induces an oscillating dipole, uh, which means, what we mean when we say we have an oscillating dipole, the relative positions between the electrons and the nucleus are moved. This means that the molecular system is in a different energy state, and this is what's referred to as a virtual state. And so this is what we're showing here is kind of an energy diagram uh, between, we have excitation from, again, it's, at a ground state up to this virtual state, and we'll show different processes from the virtual state back down to some frequency state, and uh, H plus, uh, E plus H nu, and then from this actual, say, uh, excited V state, it goes up to a higher state and back down to the ground state. But let, let's, let's talk about that for a second. So again, our incident field induces an oscillating dipole moment. We've, we've moved, we've perturbed, the electron cloud, which means the relative positions uh, are moved, they're following Coulomb's law, and that means the molecular system is actually in a different energy state than it initially started in. This is what we call a virtual state. So what, what do we mean by this? The energy level of the virtual state is higher than that of vibrational quanta, okay? So it's, it's higher than just the next vibrational level, but it's much less than that required to move to an excited electronic state. Again, we haven't, we haven't set, this isn't equal to any particular electronic transition, so electronic quantum uh, energy. So the molecule stays in its ground state. So just keep in mind, the amount that we're perturbing it by the laser moves it to a state that's higher than any just vibrational state, but it's not sufficient to move it to an uh, electronic state. Okay, so again, we haven't, done like, we haven't done like lift, okay? We haven't moved it to, to an electronic transition. Okay, now we have to think about this jumping back and forth through this energy diagram viewpoint in the real world. As we send photons through, which is electric field, the majority of it passed right on through, right? If you uh, measure the energy before and after a medium, you measure the same thing, right? You don't, there's no substantial absorption. So only, it's only about one out of 10 to the fourth of these non-resonant photons. Remember, they're not resonant because we don't go up to some uh, transition. They transition to the virtual state, and the majority just simply pass through the medium, okay? And that makes sense. They, there's no, no prop. Uh, okay? Now, we had one out of 10 to the fourth that go to this virtual state. Now, once they're in this virtual state, which is just the perturbation due to electric field of the laser, most of them just simply return back down uh, to the initial vibrational state. So again, I've made the assumption all these that we've started at the vibration, lowest vibrational level of zero. You don't have to do that, but let's just, uh, all that matters is that you're going from whatever, they're coming back down to whatever initial vibrational state you started at. You technically could do this from V double prime one and back down to one for every one. So, um, but uh, let's just say they're returning to their initial vibrational state. Now they may be redirected from the molecule a different direction, okay, and that's the spontaneous nature, and that's ultimately how we detect it, and, and we'll get to that in a little bit. But the main thing to think about this from an energy point of view is during this interaction, no energy exchange is taking place, right? No, it doesn't matter that I sat up here in this virtual state for a very small amount of time. I come back down so there's no net loss or gain of energy, okay? I perturbed it, so I sent it up, and the molecule it came right back down, okay? So if there's no change in energy, 
the photon gets emitted at the exact same frequency. And this is Rayleigh scattering. All right. Now, if we imagine in a gas we have a large number of molecules, okay, the molecular motion leads to microscopic density fluctuations. So let's think about how this, how this, this works. We have a gas, we have a uh, volume uh, of, of gas, they all have molecular motion, and due to their motion, uh, because they're not all moving uniform, right, you can get density fluctuations. Really all that's saying is you have a non-uniform distribution of scattering sources. Hopefully that makes sense. I have a big volume, I have lots of particles, because they're randomly moving at any point in time, I can have, if I zoom in on a certain volume, I'll have more here at any point in time. So I get density fluctuations, microscopic density fluctuations. Now, because of these uh, microscopic density fluctuations, uh, these fluctuations actually randomize the phase of the scattered light from each one of these emitting dipoles, each one of these uh, little molecules, right? They randomize the phase, and it leads to incoherent light in all but the forward direction. The forward, you have uh, coherent light. Now, but now even in the this direction, interference between each scattering source removes the coherence, and it turns out that the total scattered light is proportional to the number of scattering sources. Okay? So the reason this works is you end up getting, you end up getting each one of these little, you're getting fluctuations that are happening, these random fluctuations, they each scatter light, they interfere with each other, they remove, and they become this kind of incoherent light source. Okay, that's what the scattering emission is. Now, so we can say if there were not density fluctuations, okay, let's say we have something that was uniform, then the scattering from each isolated oscillator, each molecule, would cancel out in every direction but the forward direction. Okay, so you want to think about that. It's the, random, uh, the, the fluctuation, this random uh, removing the coherence effects uh, that allows us to actually see scattering. So we can say that density fluctuations, these microscopic density fluctuations, are responsible for Rayleigh scattering, okay? If we had uniform, no microscopic density fluctuations, we would get only a light, a coherent light in the forward direction, actually in the wave front of the, of the laser, okay? So the fact that we get scattering at all uh, is the fact that we have density fluctuations. That's how we actually get incoherent scattered light. Now, if we go back to the virtual state for a moment, okay, that was the Rayleigh side. If we go back to the virtual state, during the interaction between the incident electric field and the molecule, some amount of the energy equal to the vibration mode may be transferred from a photon to a molecule. Okay, so it's vibrating, uh, and the photon may give up some of its energy to a molecule when it couples uh, to the vibrational mode. That means the remaining photon energy is now less than what it started with. So this photon gives up a bit of energy to the molecule. Okay. Now what that means is that if we apply conservation of energy, then the emitted photon has to have energy uh, of H times nu minus nu vibrational. Because remember, this is the amount of energy it gave up. And so the photon now returns from this virtual state to a higher vibrational level, okay, which is frequency shifted uh, radiation. This is Stokes. Okay? We're going to a redder wavelength or a lower frequency. Okay? Okay? That's because this photon gave up energy, and we have to conserve energy. Now, we can also think about the other way. We can have uh, a photon actually in the excited state. Remember, this virtual state is actually higher than, than, let's say, some vibrational state. We can actually have, we, we talked about it uh, again, we have some fraction always sitting in the vibrational state. Remember our example, we, we, it depends on the molecule, of course, but we may have a few percent just sitting in higher vibrational states at all temperatures, especially higher temperatures. So we have some population sitting in the vibrational state, these higher vibrational states say an excited vibrational state at any time. Let's say a photon uh, comes along, it can actually gain energy from the molecule because the molecule's been excited, it's in the excited state, it's happy to give off this 
energy. So this photon actually gains energy. And therefore, now this emitted photon is H plus, H, instead of H nu, it's nu plus nu vibrational. It's actually taken vibrational energy from the molecule. This is anti-Stokes scattering. Now, both Stokes and anti-Stokes can occur simultaneously since there's a large number of molecules, but as you can probably figure out, Stokes is more probabilistic because it's much more likely that a molecule is going to be in the ground state. Okay? So if you have the ground state, this scenario here is more likely. Okay? And thus the intensity of the Stokes scattering is higher. Okay? And we can show this in theory and work it out. Um, but again, that's kind of the idea. You can have, you can have the modulate, you can have the uh, excitation, if you will, with the electric field to the virtual state, and it falls right back down, that's Rayleigh scattering. You sit to this virtual state, okay? If the photon gives up some energy, it has to fall down to a higher vibrational. If it gives up just the amount, uh, it has to be, it's quantized, right? So it has to be in these vibrational amounts. It can't just give up an arbitrary amount. Okay, so since it's given up, it can only fall down back to right to here. Or if I'm already in excited state such that I have, then I can take that quantized amount of energy, and then since I have excess energy, I can fall a further distance. Okay, it's all about the delta E. Now, a question to think about is, is this laser-induced fluorescence? Are scattering processes different from LIF processes? So they both involve the quote-unquote absorption emission of a photon, sort of, right? If we call the virtual energy state some state, they're, they're kind of an absorption and emission. Fluorescence emission can be at the same wavelength or shifted. Uh, so would we call that uh, elastic or inelastic? Would we call it Stokes or any Stokes? Um, and really, you can find the literature, fluorescence can actually be considered as a type of scattering. Some people don't agree with that. that that's split in the literature on whether or not fluorescence is just a particular type of scattering. Okay. But there, there's a kind of a primary distinction, the mechanisms that give you the signal. Okay. So fluorescence involves the complete or absorption of a photon uh, to a higher energy state. So it excites a higher energy state. And since it's going to an electronic transition, right, that means we're actually going to a different orbital, it has considerable changes to electronic configuration. Okay? So that's very funny. It's actually changing the electronic configuration. That makes that a resonant process. Rayleigh and Raman uh, involves the use of energy, any energy. You're not, you're not basically tying anything to electronic transition. It's not in resonance with change, going to a different orbital configuration. Really what you're doing is you're just, uh, you can couple to these modes. So ROM and any energy can be absorbed. You're just taking on whatever energy you're at. You just take quantized levels that are a characteristic of the particular species. So it, it, it can, you know, it can excite it to a higher vibrational mode. Um, but since it's, it's not parti resonance particular, uh, again, it's a non-resonant process. Uh, and photon emission is at a constant offset from the excitation frequency, okay? It's not at a particular electron energy gap like left, okay? So it's just about a delta nu process. So they, in some ways, if you step back, they look very similar, but it's kind of fluorescence. One of the kind of take-home would be there's considerable changes to electronic configuration. There is not in Rayleigh or Raman. Now, if we look at some of these lifetimes, lifetime in the virtual state is about 10 to the minus 14 seconds, uh, but lifetime, kind of the excited electronic state, is much about six order of magnitude longer, uh, and that's the transfer of the different rotational vibrational levels. But even the pure radiative lifetime, well, there, even some of the fastest are still much slower than this lifetime in the virtual state. Now, when we're talking about scattering processes, we typically talk about two classes of scattering that we've already talked about. We have Rayleigh scattering and Raman scattering. Now, within these things, we're, we can dig a little bit deeper, and we can say there's, uh, if we're zooming our way and zooming in, we can say, okay, there's vibrational Raman, where if this was where our laser is, right, we'll say that zero, the shift between the laser and sort of a, if we're talking about, say, nitrogen here, a vibrational system is about 2,300 wave numbers. There's some that are 1,000, but 
there are thousands of wave numbers. Then if we zoom in on this feature here, these are the rotational Raman positions. They're order tens of wave numbers. And then if we zoom in on the central feature here again, we have something that's called the Combines line, which uh, has a width of about 03 wave numbers, or about a gigahertz. And then what we're going to find is that within here, there's brilliant effects, there's the main thermal effect, the place, uh, the Plasic trace line, and you actually have a Q branch rotational Raman line sitting here as well. So as we work our way out, we can say vibrational Raman, rotational Raman, and then Rayleigh Brillion. Okay, and again we have Brillion lobes and Rayleigh lobes. Uh, there is no Rayleigh lobe. Uh, that's just a just nomenclature that's been adopted. So this is kind of what we'll look at. The rest of this lecture we'll look at Rayleigh scattering, and then we'll deal with Raman tomorrow. So Rayleigh scatter. Let's go back. Let's start with just the elastic portion. Right now, let's forget about all of this. This is the stuff that's modulated. Right now, I've written Raman as vibration, but we certainly can write this in that same way as omega rotational, and that's rotational Raman. Okay? So let's just deal with the elastic portion of the dipole moment right now. Okay, all we have to do is sort of jump to the end here. In lecture two, we gave pointings vector gave the intensity of the electric field. So we want to look at the scattering, which is the time average of this flux. And we worked all the way through that and found that that was the square of the electric field. Well, but remember, that started off this lecture before the break, we had an expression of the electric field, the scattered electric field. So all we have to do is take the magnitude of that as squared. Okay? So if you go back about, let's see, I'm in slide 18, go back about 16 slides, you'll find the expression for the scattered electric field. And this is just from the definition of pointings vector. Substituting that quantity, and you actually find that the scattered uh, intensity, if you will, is equal to, we have the uh, dipole moment, we have this omega to the fourth, that's the laser frequency. We have our observation angle, or the projection here. And then the whole, we have our distance r, with speed of light, we have epsilon naught, with the, which is essentially dielectric constant, okay? Now, what we can figure out is that if we want the time average power, remember these things are oscillating. We talked about this in, I think, lecture two, that these things are oscillating very fast so that we can average over a time much longer than the characteristic oscillation frequency, but still say on, shorter than the laser on the same time scale as the laser. If we integrate over a spherical surface, we can get the time average power and it just simply is equal to this. So we have the time average power uh, over kind of a spherical surface containing the dipole, okay? Now, if we denote that this, inten this in uh, instant intensity, again, it scales as the uh, in electric field squared, if we substitute that in, all we've done is now written our time average power as the incident intensity, okay? We haven't done anything else there. Now, if we, same as when we were talking about me scattering, remember we said a cross section can be easily defined as the fraction of the scattered power divided by the total incident intensity. So we can do the exact same way. And therefore, that means that if we just divide our average P divided by I, we have what we call the scattering cross section for a spherical scatter because we integrate it around a spherical shell. Okay? Now, if we want to remove some of this geometrical dependence, commonly it's a differential scattering cross-section is defined in this, in this manner, and this just turns out to be the definition of it. So our, our scattered intensity is proportional to the incident intensity, and then we have this differential scattering cross-section uh, divided by 1 over r squared to remove the geometric dependence as we sort of propagate away. So in that manner, we end up with a differential scattering cross-section for a spherical scatter. It's pi squared, alpha squared, polar's ability, sine squared, epsilon squared, lambda to the four, uh, fourth. Okay, now let's simplify these a bit. We can relate the polar's ability to the index of refraction through the Lorentz-Lorenz equation, well-known equation. 
such that when we simplify this, our scattering cross-section is now proportional to the, the refractive index almost to the fourth power, and our differential scattering cross-section has this exact same relationship. Okay? So we actually have some uh, interesting features that are starting to point, show up here is that we have this lambda, inverse lambda to the fourth here and some observational angle dependent. Now, we have this term that, again, if we go back one, we have this term here that we want to simplify and get rid of. If we take a Taylor expansion about n squared minus 1 and approximate the gas as 1, we ultimately end up getting rid of higher order terms. And it turns out that it simplifies to just this expression here, just by taking a Taylor expansion. Now, again, we're left with our, these two final equations, okay, such that we have our scattering cross-section is equal to this, and our differential scattering cross-section is equal to this expression. Again, if you've worked within Rayleigh scattering, these are expressions that you would be used to seeing. Now, these are only for simple symmetric scatters. So think about a spherical. So for an atom, this is correct. But it does offer some very good uh, insights. One, we can see the uh, wavelength to the four, fourth dependence. Okay? This is what's responsible for the sky color, right? Scatter, blue sky scatters much more efficiently than green or red, okay? And so that's why our sky appears blue. And that's about the limit of our visible, okay? Oh, if we could see UV, it would appear ultraviolet. But since we, we kind of limited in detecting, we see a blue sky, okay? So we see the wavelength dependence here, okay? And we also can see uh, we still have observation dependence that I'll come back to. Now, one thing that we have here is that this lambda to the fourth possibly suggests the use of very high energy UV sources. In fact, why wouldn't you use, instead of, let's say, a YAG laser at 532, if I just frequency double it to 266, uh, I get, what, two to the fourth times more photons, okay? But I will, there are certain cautions of the reason why visible light is always used. One is that your energy is going to go down as you do this, not by a factor of 16, but let's say by a factor of 4. But it's okay, you're still doing well. Cameras are much more sensitive in the visible than they are in the UV, okay? And also, you have a tremendous number of interferences in the ultraviolet. In fact, you can excite things in fluorescence molecules, all these pHs, anything, all these large organic molecules, anything in combustion, it becomes a kind of a nightmare to work in the, in the UV with Raman scattering, Rayleigh or Raman scattering, okay? Especially Raman scattering because that signal is so weak. But I just keep it, you'll still see a lot of people who do 266 and 355 nanometers or maybe even Exmer lasers that are like 248, 193. With Rayleigh scattering, you potentially can get away with it. Uh, with Raman, it, it, it's not a, not a great idea. So just keep in, keep in mind there can be interferences with LIF processes. Okay. Now, also we can see uh, cross-section zero at angle, zero degrees. Okay, that's been for spherical models, uh, ser yeah, for spherical um, symmetric models, spherical symmetric uh, scatters. But now we need to move to real, real molecules. They're not symmetric. Some are close. They're not spherical. Uh, and so the, in this manner, the, the kind of the complication in this now comes in the fact that the induced dipole does not have to lie in the same direction as the applied electric field. If that means that, what that means when they had to lie in the electric field because they were symmetric, that means that the dipole moment electric field had to be related only by a uh, proportionality constant, and that was scalar alpha. But now that means alpha can be a vector, okay? So the random orientation of the molecule with respect to electric field and with respect to the observation requires that the scattering model has to be extended now and averaged over all molecular orientations. So what you end up getting is this. Instead of this being a scalar polar's ability, this is now a three by three polar's ability tensor, okay? 
Okay, since it's symmetric, symmetric matrix, there's only six unique components of alpha i, j, and so we typically deal with the components p, x, p, y, and p, z. These are their components. Okay, you can work this out. Now, what I'm going to do is just go ahead and say, let's go ahead and, and, and simplify our bit and deal with the case to where our electric field is propagating in the x direction, okay? If it's instead of just any random, you can do this as any random orientation as well. But let's say we have it propagating in the x, and so in that, that means that our uh, electric field can be broken into two polarization components. Remember, we, we did this uh, in lecture uh, two with electromagnetic theory. Any random orientation can be broken into polarization. So we have EIY and EIZ, and beta is the angle between the incident field polarization and the z axis. If you want to see the very general solution, again, the, the nice review paper by Dick Miles and co-workers uh, is in me 2001 Measurement Science Technology. This gives you this, the general solution. We're going to go with the case that's most commonly used in experiments. So we have a laser propagating in the X direction. It's going to have vertical polarization. So that means it only has polarization in the z direction, and we collect only along the y direction, so 90 degrees, okay? So for this case, there's only two polarization components of scattered intensity. We can get what we'll call uh, I perpendicular and I parallel, and these are with reference to the actual um, z direction, okay? The, the direction of the polarization, okay? So we have a direction that's parallel, uh, with the direction of the polarization and a component that's perpendicular with direction of the polarization. Now, our dipole moment's now reduced to something much simpler, just a PZ and a PX. We don't have to consider the PY component. Now, in general, the molecules have random orientations, so we have to average over all orientations, and this actually can be done as cast as a mean polarizability and the isotropy factor. So we have this mean polarizability that can be considered as the diagonal components, uh, and then we can have the anisotropy uh, factor here. And then so what we get here, the orientation averages, again, are just the mean just can be written as in these two expressions here. Okay, these are just doing some math and manipulating, getting our averages. Okay, so what this does is gives us our two components of the dipole moment. Remember, we have a PZ and a PX. Okay, we don't have anything in the Y. These are just substituting back in because we had to have our alpha, com our alpha component here, and I mean, our, we had to have our two different components of the polarizability tensor. We only have two. So we, we put in this component here and this component here. Now, we can go back and look at the scattered intensity for each polarization, okay? Remember, our polarization was proportional to the uh, mean uh, power, if you will. And so what we can do, we have just these two expressions. This is now the scattered intensity for the component that is parallel to the direction of polarization of the electric field. And we have the intensity that's perpendicular to the, compo to the direction uh, of the polarization direction of the electric field. Now, we need to add those together because the total scattered light, we collect both of them in general. So we end up with this, our scattered light is proportional to the instant light, and then we have our mean polarizability and our and isotropy factors. Well, we can calculate our differential scattering cross-section from the from this exact same expression, right? Remember, our scatter, differential scattering cross-section can be related to the fraction that we scattered divided by uh, the instant intensity. And we can recast this. Typically, what's fine in the literature is that you'll find the effect of the various polarizations are written in this depolarization ratio, rho, which is just the ratio of the, of the portion that's perpendicular to parallel, okay? And the depolarization ratio 
is just written uh, in this manner. So again, this term in equation 215 can be manipulated through algebra, and you end up with this equation. Again, work through the steps. All it is is, uh, is, is algebra and substitution. But what you get uh, is an expression for the differential scattering cross section. There's a V here. This is only for the orientation that we chose. We have an electric field polarized in the, in the Z direction, and we're collecting at 9 degrees along the Y. So only for, quote, unquote, a vertically polarized laser beam, and we're collecting at 90 degrees, okay? If you have any other orientation, any random, this, this is different. You can see that in that paper by Miles. But what you see here is we have the exact same expression for a spherically symmetric scatter and a correction term that's for the depolarization. Okay? And you can look if the depolarization is zero. Remember, it's the, uh, if the depolarization is zero, meaning that there's no effects of the uh, essentially the geometry or the orientation of the molecule, this goes right back to what a symmetric scatter is. Now, this previous equation with the intensity was for a single scattering source. Uh, we need to deal with the fact that we have molecular motion randomizes all the scattered fields for each molecule, coherence fits cancel, and what we get is the total scattering is the sum of the scattering from each molecule. This is very long-winded of saying that we can just do a summation of over all the scattering for all these different, so, so all these little emitting dipoles, we can just add them all up, okay? Now, so that the way that we want to deal with this is that we have a probe volume. So in the probe volume, wherever our laser, whether it's this or a sheet, that's where all our scatterers are, okay? So we have our probe volume. We have a number density within that probe volume. We have a scattering cross-section, and we have the, intent, uh, the uh, instant intensity. Okay? Again, we can only collect a portion of that through this finite collection volume. Okay? And it's a function of our optical setup with some efficiency eta. So we write this way now, very similar to what we did for LIF. The intensity of our scatter, or our Rayleigh scattering is proportional to our incident intensity, okay, times the efficiency of our optical setup, times the number of scatters that are in our volume. Here's another collection optics. And then this is the ratio. Our, collect, our scattering cross-section basically tells us the number of scattered versus the instant number of photons. Now, Every species has a different scattering cross-section. So we get what a mixture average when as a weight, molar weighted average version. So we take whatever a mole fraction of every species that are in the probe volume, multiply it times its individual scattering cross-section, and that becomes the mixture average scattering cross-section for the probe volume. So again, we can take and just look at a mole fr a fraction weighted average uh, for what exists in the, in the probe volume. So if we take and put all of that together, our scattered intensity is now equal to some constant. So I've replaced the geometric eta and our collection angle. We have our intensity E, because I can get rid of some of the other, take it, remember there's an expression, we can relate the intensity with the energy in the area. Okay, and then I take our number density, assume the ideal gas law here, so we got P over KT, and we have our mixture average scattering cross-section. So that looks like the intensity that I'm going to collect when I perform a Rayleigh scattering measurement is going to be proportional to the energy of my beam, the pressure, because if the pressure increases, I have more scatters. Temperature increases, I have less scatters and then whatever the, my scattering cross-section is. So a fairly straightforward and intuitive equation. So we'll work within this equation for applications. So all of that, basically all the work is to end up deriving an expression for the differential scattering cross-section. So a couple things we need to note is that 
one of the biggest pro problems with Rayleigh scattering is it's not species specific, right? What you get is a mole fraction weighted effect due to this mixture average scattering cross section. It has no idea what's in the probe volume, okay? So it's not species specific. So the two primary applications of Rayleigh scattering are mixing measurements under non-reacting conditions and temperature measurements under reacting conditions. And let's talk about how we do both of these. So the previous equation just on, we just flipped over from, let's assume that we have isobaric, so P is constant and isothermal T is constant. Okay? So let's assume this is the mixing stage before combustion occurs well upstream. You know, ignition hasn't happened yet. Okay, we're looking at the mixing stage. Now, let's assume uh, the constant C and incident intensity do not vary. Uh, from, uh, let's, let, let's put it this way, let's, uh, let's say that every, let's say nothing in our geometry changes from measurement to measurement. Um, and in, in, in local intensity does not vary. And if it does, uh, just going back to a question that was earlier, we usually make an uh, energy correction. Okay. So what I mean by that, let's, if we assume a binary mixture consisting of species one and species two, if we normalize, let's go back to what I call equation 221 here. If we normalize this by a reference measurement, right? I'm gonna, I put this as a reference measurement. I seasonal cancel, right? I say nothing in the geometry changes, okay? Let's say I use the same energy between this measurement and my reference measurement, ideal world. They cancel, you know, isothermal, P cancels, P cancels, K's cancel, okay? So everything cancels except for this ratio of scattering cross section, right? So I normalize it, my reference condition this time was just species one. So let's say that's fuel. We're looking at fuel and oxidizer mixing. So if I make this measurement at any mixed condition, but then I take and normalize by a mixture of pure fuel or pure one, this is what the equation looks like. Okay? The only thing, the only thing that gives rise to my signal. Uh, the signal ratio is the ratio of the two scattering cross sections. Well, the scattering cross section, remember, is a mixture averaged uh, value of the scattering cross section. So when you have two, that's just x1 times cross section of one plus x2, which is one minus x1 for binary system, times the scattering cross section of two. And then here's our reference condition. Okay? So then you just manipulate that call these differential cross-sections primes, and you can actually find your mole fraction of species one is just related to the difference in the intensity from your mixed uh, condition over your pure reference condition. You know the scattering cross-section of species two, species one, and therefore through this you end up having a measurement of uh, the mole fraction of species one just based on the signal that you measure or signal ratio after you normalize. Now, once you know the mole fraction, you can substitute in the mass fraction. Once you know the mass fraction, you can get, for people who work in combustion, you can get the mixture fraction, okay? And then you can clean this up a bit and you can actually find, if we call fuel and air one and two, this turns out to be your expression X fuel is equal to the ratio of uh, the Rayleigh scattering in the mixed condition divided by intensity over pure air. Uh, the, the, and then we have in the denominator the ratio of the scattering, differential scattering cross sections of air and fuel. These are all known, these are all tabulated, these are all measured. Okay, if you don't know it, you can measure it fairly easy. Okay, so what would a typical setup look like? Let's say we have a a, a turbulent jet, let's just do a simple experiment. Uh, we send in a high energy laser sheet. Let's put in something like propane extruding the air has a large scattering cross section compared to air, but they have different, that's what's important. 
Here we show making a, a laser sheet intensity correction, but don't worry about that. These are the type of images you can get, okay? And these are the example of a turbulent propane jet issuing in the air and looking at the mixing conditions. So these are just written in terms of a fluctuation. But again, you can see no fluctuation. This is the ambit. And you can see the very fine detailed structure of the turbulent mixing process just from using uh, Rayleigh scattering. Quite, quite beautiful images, in fact. Another application is to go into the... Uh, this is at Sandia. This is an engine simulator. Okay. This is a, a system that has very well-defined ambient conditions, anywhere from 300 to 1300 K, can operate up 350 bar uh, EGR. I just like the system. This is a case to where they do injection into this system and then have used Rayleigh scattering downstream of the droplets. You can't do this in the droplets, right? They will interfere with everything. Okay? But if you look at this experiment, they have a fuel injector, fuel comes in, and then they do a measurement down here. Uh, they do a measurement here, but you're not getting Rayleigh. You're just getting particle scatter or droplet scattering. Okay, so here's how it looks. Just transversing by 90 degrees, the laser comes in. You see the quote-unquote me, they call it, the scattering from the particle. But then down here, uh, two separate experiments because the dynamic range wouldn't support this. But here's the actual uh, Rayleigh scattering. It is gaseous. It's evaporated. The heptane has evaporated. Okay? And you actually can see the heptane fuel jet uh, issuing into the ambient. Wonderful experiment. The striations, as you've probably figured out, is at 40 atmospheres, so the index refraction problems are, are a nightmare. But, uh, so anyway, a uh, beautiful demonstration of Rayleigh scattering in, a, in an extreme uh, environment. And then, I, I won't go into it, but, but if you do some manipulation of the equations, you actually can get kind of a free parameter. You can get temperature uh, at the exact same time, uh, just due to uh, making some assumptions about uh, the, the heat capacity in the mixing system. But the bottom line, this is a Rayleigh uh, measurement uh, in, in a high pressure chamber. And some wonderful uh, measurements, a lot of data has come out on the downstream mixing under these uh, conditions. Now under flames, we need to think about the fact that compo what happens, composition typically varies in a fr flame, right? And we just said Rayleigh scattering is not species specific. So cross sections will be very different, lean, rich, stoichiometric conditions. How, uh, you know, how do we measure temperature? So let's, let's manipulate our equation. You, you probably can see that all I've done is substitute in the ideal gas law, canceled the P's, uh, for isobaric conditions. And this is really what you turn out to have. A temperature would be equal to a reference te temperature from your reference measurement. So there's your signal, temperature, differential scattering cross-section for your reference condition. Again, that would be the mixture average scattering cross-section from wherever you're measuring, and that's the signal from whatever you're measuring. Okay? So these are just your reference condition. This could be air, right? It could be something that would be air at 300 degrees, so 300 K, the signal coming from air, uh, the differential scattering cross-section from air. Okay. Now, what we have here is in lean premixed flames, the major species in N2, so a common assumption is just to say, okay, everything is N2. Okay. Since I don't know what it is, everything is N2, and you operate in that manner. Okay. And then if the reference condition is pure N2 for some reason, then you get this expression here. However, I want to point out that care should be taken with this approach because any deviation of the mixture average cross-section from the assumed nitrogen cross-section can actually lead to some sizable errors under certain circumstances. We've been working on this a bit, and we can show that it can be quite large uh, under some circumstances. Okay. So let's go back uh, and look at, at our expression. Uh, again, the we can write our intensity, uh, Rayleigh scattering intensity as being proportional to 1 over T times, times the cross-section. Let's look at some of the cross-sections for gases and see how much they vary. See if this is a big deal. These are at 532 nanometers at standard temperature and pressure. And you see oxygen is closest about 87% of nitrogen. Hydrogen is about 21% of nitrogen. CO is about 20 to 30 percent larger than nitrogen. CO2 is about 2.2 times larger than nitrogen. 
Water is about 70% or so of nitrogen, and propane is about 13 times higher than nitrogen. I'm not doing those out of the top of my head. I just know what the ratios are. I wasn't going to mention something to sound like I could just do that. I can't do that that quick. But I just know what the ratios are. But coming back to this, they can vary quite a bit, even if you don't have something like propane or hydrocarbons. They're varying anywhere from 0.2 to 2 point something with respect to nitrogen. Okay. So you can see that you can have this quite a differential change uh, in the system, leading to 20, 30 percent uncertainty. Okay. So again, another way to do this is to correlate uh, the mixture average scattering cross-section, or, or again, the measured intensity. Um, and so instead of assuming that you know what the mixture is, uh, go to, say, you can either measure a correlation of different systems, or what I say here is that if you kind of run a laminar flame simulation, you then have access to all the species as a function of temperature or a progress variable. You can actually map out a temperature differential scattering cross-section relationship from a laminar flame, and then you can apply that uh, in your turbulent flame. What you're assuming there is that the thermochemical state that exists under laminar flame conditions is the same that occurs within turbulent flames. That may or may not be right, but it may be better than just assuming it's nitrogen. This is what's done, uh, has been done in the work. This is work uh, Omar Goulder at Toronto. Uh, here's work from my lab in, in pre-mixed flames, um, and it enables, uh, actually we've shown that it's pretty accurate under a lot of, lot of different conditions. Okay? Um, this is a good way to point out the difference between taking the measurements with an ICCD and taking them with CCDs. Okay? You can, uh, much difference in the signal noise, the structure you can resolve, uh, and the lack of noise. Okay, what about non-premixed flames? Okay, this is challenging because in general, the differential scattering cross-section is going to vary throughout the entire domain, going from fuel to products to oxidizer. Okay, fuel and oxidizer are separated by gas by the the product. So what's typically done is that you consider a specialized set of jet flames with a particular fuel. So really, the most common is to this, this DLR set of, uh, uh, again, it's uh, methane, hydrogen, nitrogen flames, where the mixture is mixed in certain proportions such that the scattering cross-section changes by, say, less than 3% from fuel, air, and all products. Okay. So what you've done is you've really fuel tailored, you generate a particular fuel such that the scattering cross-section is constant everywhere. If you look at that, if it's, scat, uh, if it's uh, constant everywhere, then once you do, say, a reference with air, okay, the, uh, it goes away, and you end up with a temperature measurement that's just inversely proportional to your measured signal. You know, your signal is going to go down with temperature, and then your, your temperature is deduced. Let's say this 300K is your reference. It's 300 times the ratio of your reference signal measured at that room temperature air condition uh, to uh, I Rayleigh. And this is what's commonly done. This is work from Jonathan Frank from Sandia. Very nice temperature images in, in, in flames. So good that you can get temperature gradient and dissipation images. And we've worked a lot with this flame system in my lab as well to get temperature measurements. So I'll end with sort of the pros and cons of Rayleigh scattering. Its pros are the implementation is quite straightforward. It's a non-resonant process, so you can use any laser. This allows you to get sort of instant, uh, it, it, again, it's not any laser, so that means you can really use high energy, high power pulse lasers. Okay, then that allows us to get sort of two instantaneous images and topology. Uh, and again, with under certain circumstances, we can get temperature concentration, and with you working hard, you can get pretty good sensitivity and resolution. Now, the cons are that it's not species-specific, so you get absolutely no species information. Again, outside of the sort of controlled setting, rhythm, fuel tailoring, or you know, making certain assumptions about the thermochemical state, 
signal interpretation may be very difficult. Now, here's the biggest one, I think, is the scattering is at nominally at the same wavelength as the laser. So that means that if you have surfaces, windows, particulate, all the scattering off of that will give you interferences that are much higher than the Rayleigh scattering gas, the gas phase signal. Okay? So it really is limited a lot to uh, um, open uh, flame systems. So what we'll talk about in the next lecture is filter Rayleigh scattering that gives a possible solution for, for a lot of these problems. And with that, this lecture's over and at 523, I think it's better to take questions and then we'll start in Raman scattering tomorrow, okay? So any questions? Yes? What are some of the... Uh, so you said if in certain circumstances you can... Oh, so, so what are those, what I'm referring to is what I just talked about, where we have, to, we have to make certain assumptions either about the thermochemical state or we have to mix a certain fuel. Okay, you just can't get it broadly. I can't go, you can't burn JP8 and stick my... I'll get a signal, right? No problem but I don't know how to interpret because it's a function of the differential scattering cross-section, which is a function of all the species that I don't know. So I have to control things. So many times for Rayleigh scattering, we work with not exotic, but very particular fuel mixtures, very simple fuels, because what we're doing is we're more interested in the fundamentals of, say, turbulent combustion, where we really don't care what the fuel is. If you're caring about something that's sort of fuel-specific, then a lot of the arguments that we make kind of go out, go out the window. So, but if, you're, if you just want a flame system to get temperature, then we can kind of dial in the exact fuel we want, the exact conditions we want. And then we can get quantitative measurements. You need, because now you have two unknowns, right? And so you certainly would have to have a measurement of the pressure, right? The only one that you can, get away with this is what I was talking about in those engine situations, I've done this in other, is that if you have a variation in temperature, if you have no reaction and you have a two-stream problem and you have a variation in both temperature and concentration, you can get this due to the relationship with CPs and you can do this with a specific heat balance as well. That gives you your second equation. But if, it's, uh, if the pressure is changing, you need something else to give you that information. Other questions? No? Okay. Well, have a good night, and I'll see you tomorrow.